This Veterans Day weekend, I had the opportunity to visit Gettysburg. As most of you may know, this was the site of the bloodiest battle in US history, with over 50,000 casualties and about 7,000 people killed in a three-day period. It is often touted as the battle that decided the Civil War, and it has been immortalized through its preservation as a battlefield memorial and a cemetery, as well as through cinema. It is also the site of Abraham Lincoln's Gettysburg Address, which, while brief, was deeply consequential and serves as a cornerstone of a new understanding of American principles. This video today won't be a full deep dive into everything, although I do plan on doing that soon, but we'll still go over it. This is almost more of a vlog video of my visit, at least that's what I said when I first started writing this. So I hope you enjoy, and remember to like, comment, subscribe, hit the notification bell, and follow me on Instagram and Twitter, where I'm starting to post more short form content. So first things first, prep. If you can't already tell, I'm quite the history nerd, and when I visit a historical place, I really like to learn a lot about it beforehand so that I can fully appreciate what I'm looking at. This is especially true for battlefields, since oftentimes it can just sort of look like a field with a few plaques around it. I didn't know much about the Civil War, so I did a bit of a crash course on the battle, watching a bunch of YouTube videos from American Battlefield Trust and vlogging through history and oversimplified and all that stuff, learning about the tactics and weapons of the time, and of course watching the movie Gettysburg, which I honestly feel like is one of my favorite war movies now. Right now in the DC area, I live about two hours from the field, and we traveled on a nice November weekend. The actual battle took place in July, and that was one of the hottest times of the year, but we were lucky to visit with mild, sunny weather. Honestly, couldn't ask for a better day. I visited along with a class trip led by a veteran college professor, so we were in good hands even without an official guide, and that of course made the whole thing free except for gas money. It turns out that I was kind of overprepared for the trip. I had a small backpack with an extra layer and water, and we mostly drove around so it didn't matter. We all met up at the visitor's center first, which doesn't even allow you to bring in backpacks, pocket knives, any of that stuff, so I actually had to go back to the car to put stuff away. The visitor's center is a museum as well as a place to buy tickets and merchandise, but I didn't end up getting any footage in there, so here's some clips from the National Park Service. Inside is a wall of weapons, which I didn't get to nerd out on, as well as a map of the battle, a couple dioramas, an introductory film narrated by Morgan Freeman, and part of a tree from the battlefield with shrapnel still stuck in it. This is a good place to start your tour, even if you already know your way around. While we drove, there's also walking trails and guided tours, and you can get guided tours on your phone as well if you don't want to pay money. Our first stop on the tour was McPherson's Ridge, which would be totally nondescript if it weren't for the cannons and monuments running along the road. This is where the battle started on July 1st, 1863. This won't be a full deep dive into the battle, but here's a decent summary. The two sides in the Civil War, the Confederates and the Union, essentially had opposing strengths. The Union had a far higher population, larger military, infinitely better material wealth. There were more factories in the North than there were factory workers in the South, and that was part of the reason that the South was so economically dependent on slavery and was willing to fight for it. As such, the South had no chance of winning the war through attrition, since the North could always make more stuff and send in more people than the South. However, the South had a much stronger will than the North, and the population of the North was split on even supporting the war or for how long to fight it. As such, the two sides had different strategies. The North had to atrophy the South economically to force a surrender, while the South had to attack the North's will to fight, an especially important task in 1863 and 64 in the lead up to the presidential election. To attack the North's will to fight, Confederate General Robert E. Lee decided on a strategy to cause insecurity in the Union. Moving into Pennsylvania, he planned on burning Harrisburg, the state capital, before moving on Washington, D.C. If he could succeed, it's possible that Lincoln would look bad enough to be voted out of office being replaced by George McClellan. 
McClellan would have been fine with making a compromise with the South, either letting them secede or just keeping slavery legal. From my quick research on the topic, it wasn't as open and shut as that since Lincoln dominated the Electoral College, even though he was actually very scared that he wouldn't as soon as a month before the election. Further, McClellan was inconsistent on what he actually wanted to do, and by the time of the election, the South was in pretty bad shape, and it became apparent that the war was easily winnable soon. Still, the Democratic platform called for an end to hostility and was anti-abolitionist, and Lincoln only won 55% of the popular vote, so maybe this was as dire as he said. Anyways, Lee struck into Pennsylvania, using the mountains as a screen to hide his movements from the north. On June 28th, Lincoln had fired the previous Union General of the Potomac and had appointed General George Meade. Lee, who was arguably the best general of the war, saw Meade as vulnerable and inexperienced, and thought that this would only improve his chances. On July 1st, some of his men moved into Gettysburg to get supplies and shoes, when they chanced on dismounted Union cavalry starting the fight. Our professor talked about the battle as a battle of three ridges. McPherson Ridge, Seminary Ridge, and Cemetery Ridge. By controlling the high ground, a given side had a strong position and could win the day, especially if they had time to fortify their position. Further, the ridges were about a kilometer apart, especially between Seminary and Cemetery Ridge, pretty much maximum cannon range, essentially making this a perfect place for battle. Anyways, Brigadier General Buford of the Union, seeing the Confederates coming, set up positions on the ridge and fence line next to it, shooting at the approaching column, which was in a bad position initially, since they were hemmed in on the road. Buford's forces were starting to get outnumbered until General Reynolds came to support him from the south. However, Reynolds was quickly shot off his horse and killed, and there's a monument on that spot, but I don't think I got a picture of it. You'll also notice that the monuments and cannons on the side of the road actually mark exact locations of where some of these guns were on that day, and the monuments represent units that fought in those very spots. The battle continued while more troops from both sides came to fight. Crucially, Confederate General Ewell's men flanked the Union on McPherson Ridge, setting up cannons on the high ground and perpendicular to them, making the position untenable. This was our second stop, and today it is the site of the Eternal Light Peace Memorial, which would actually inspire JFK's grave. The Union had to withdraw from McPherson's Ridge, fighting Southerners in the north and through the town of Gettysburg, trying to buy time for incoming Union troops to get established on Cemetery Ridge. Lee ordered Ewell to move his men and take Cemetery Ridge, if practicable, while Ewell took it to Mint, if convenient. As such, Ewell, whose men had marched 25 miles that day and fought a tough battle, didn't move east to take the ridge and repeat his feat. As such, the Union was able to work through the night and fortify their position, running from Little Round Top in the south to Culp's Hill in the north, rounding east to make a fishhook shape. Meanwhile, the Confederates were able to seize McPherson and Seminary Ridge. The next day, the Confederates attacked the flanks of the Union. In the south, Southern forces charged uphill trying to take Little Round Top, which while a smaller rise than its neighboring Big Round Top, was actually cleared of trees so it could be used to fire artillery and was thus tactically useful. This attack was repelled by the 20th Maine. In the north, on Culp's Hill, a similar attack was launched, but since Ewell hadn't attacked the previous day, the Union was able to fortify their position and were able to repel the Confederates there too. At the same time, in the center, General Sickles of the Union had actually moved off of his position by half a mile to a peach orchard where he felt he had a better position. This was a major blunder as Sickles' unit was destroyed and the General lost a leg. Plus, this left a major gap in the line. While the South moved into the gap, the Union had to do something to buy time for other units to plug the hole. Here, one of the most heroic moments of the war took place when General Hancock ordered the 1st Minnesota Regiment of 262 men 
to charge two oncoming Confederate brigades, totaling around 1,200 men. As the 1st Minnesota charged full speed downhill into the Confederates crossing the creek, withering fire decimated the regiment. Still, the charge worked and delayed the Confederates, and the Union was able to plug the gap and hold the line. Only 47 men from the 1st Minnesota were left standing. We didn't have time to visit either of the hills on the flanks, but we did visit the Minnesota Monument and saw the place where they charged. On the third day of fighting, Lee had a decision to make. The Union was strongest on their flanks, and even then, the Confederate assaults had almost pushed through. But if the Union was strongest on their flanks, it meant that their center must be weak. The Union, for their part, expected the fight on that day to be on the flanks again, if there was even to be any fighting at all, and as such, depleted units like the 1st Minnesota were put in the center where they expected to see little action. Why were they not concerned about the center? Well, because there was a mile wide field in between cemetery and seminary ridges here. When you look across the valley from the North Carolina Monument, it really seems like a long way. And from the Union side, it feels like it would definitely have been a long wait as well. Little did they know that Lee was planning on doing exactly that. To this day, the move is debated as either crazy or 4D chess levels of smart. But here's what happened. Lee ordered a massive artillery barrage against the Union positions, targeting their cannons to give his men a chance to cross the field. The Union ended up firing back, and it is said that the combined effort was the largest military barrage in the Western Hemisphere and could be heard over 30 miles away. But both sides weren't really hitting their mark. Since cannons make lots of smoke and move every time you fire them, it's hard to correct your aim with them. The Confederates were desperate, as if they gave up the barrage now to correct, then the Union would have time to fortify their position. The Union, however, had time on their side, and when they decided they weren't doing any damage, stopped firing to conserve ammo. Lee took this as the sign that the Union guns had been destroyed, and so he sent General Pickett and others, and 12,000 men, to cross the open field and charge the soft Union center. When the Union saw the massive Confederate force coming, they resumed fire. Long-range cannonballs and shells were used for most of the charge. When the Southerners crossed the road, canister shot was used and the Union soldiers, laying behind a stone wall, opened fire with their rifles. Pickett's men were decimated, but amazingly, some were able to break through the Union line. A brigade from North Carolina was able to push past the wall, engaging in close quarters combat, and made it within about 30 yards of the cannons. At this point, the guns opened fire with double canister and ripped apart the brigade, forcing a retreat. The Union also began to flank and pincer the Confederate charge, making the destruction total. Despite this questionable tactic by the Confederacy, the Union line had broke, and the high watermark of the Confederacy was set. This was the closest they got to winning the war, being beaten largely by the 69th Pennsylvania Regiment, who called the state home. When it was all said and done, the Confederates had lost 28,000 casualties to the Union's 23,000. Lee was forced to retreat back into Virginia, while along the Mississippi, General Grant won a massive victory at Vicksburg, effectively surrounding the Confederacy and putting the dual nails in the coffin on the war. So that's it for this video. Hope you enjoyed. I wish I got a little more footage for you guys. Uh, let me know what you think about this style of video. And remember to like, comment, subscribe, hit the notification bell. Follow me on Instagram and Twitter X. And I will see you in the next one. Goodbye.